good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, welcome to this third session of day 2 of the hyderabad literary festival 2021 uh you will also probably be listening to one of the most important issues that we as a country face today from someone who deserves to be heard a hundred times uh, we are delighted to have with us harsh mandar harsh mandar is perhaps the foremost human rights activist in the country and um, someone who has done more work uh, with survivors of mass violence hunger homeless street children uh, uh, who has done more for working in the society to uh, stop this tide of divisiveness that's happening polarization that's happening and over the last one year he has done humongous work on uh, working with the migrants uh, and the, the migrant problem i mean he is a hero for all of us and uh, it's um, uh, he is going to talk today on locking down the poor and that's a very important uh, issue uh, based on his new book and uh, uh, we are i'm looking forward keenly to listen to him uh, engaging him in conversation is with is professor amirullah khan um amir is a friend of uh, hyderabad and a friend of all of us uh, he is a development economist teaches at ms crhrd at uh, tis isp nalsar he is a business columnist for the live mint he has been a senior advisor at the bill and melinda gates foundation and uh, uh, does some amazing uh, work uh, on activism in multiple ways Uh, delighted to have you Amir here and uh, so it's it's uh, both of you carry on i just put off my video and come back later thank you so much both of you please thanks ajay uh, uh, thanks to hlf manthan for uh, you know for conceptualizing this i am sure um, uh, dr harsh mandar will agree with me that this is one platform that that is really a sensitive sensible amazingly insightful platform that we are also delighted and proud to be with so thanks ajay for getting me uh, of course uh, ashmandar is somebody who uh, who uh, is important for any such discussion as you so vividly put it so let me uh, delve straight in because we have about 40 minutes and we have so much to talk about that that is really a sensitive sensible amazingly insightful platform that we are also delighted and proud it is a playback that is happening okay um all right so uh, for the viewers uh, a quick uh, introduction you all know harshwinder very well i mean harshwinder is possibly today our uh, our foremost uh, public intellectual uh, apart from being a great social activist um today we are dealing with uh, harshwinder the intellectual uh and um, and the reason i am here is only because i am his most devoted disciple i have been uh, following him uh, trying to emulate some 2% of what he does uh and and follow that prototype as much as i could and encourage a lot of others to do that because uh, by god we need a thousand hash wonders today uh we uh, will amir, start off uh, amir, was, amir was my student in masuri in the academy when i was on the faculty uh, for young civil servants so that's that's another bond that we have <laughs> thank you so much sir it's been a good 27 years that i have uh, been your student um so welcome to the hyderabad literary festival i mean hyderabad is is my city just as much as it is yours and the literary festival you are very familiar with has been one of the Uh, one of the most uh, most insightful and one of the most inclusive festivals uh, for 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 years now um uh, we will uh, start off with uh, talking about the book and you know this is a book that we have all read uh, some of us very very seriously um the the immediate question the first question is um, why the book i mean you know you you wrote this at a time when you were Busy, you were unwell, you were fighting a thousand battles. 
and yet you thought it was important to take time off to chronicle uh, this episode and so quickly so first question is why did you write it and why did you write it so quickly uh amit i wrote it i think because uh the explosion of human suffering uh, that i was witness to every day i was on the streets from almost the second or third day of the lockdown uh, initially because i work also with homeless people and also with the riot victims in mustafabad so initially uh, in in delhi i i thought i must be on the streets uh, uh, you know even for a day how will they manage without work and food and then it grew uh, because we started getting distress calls from all over the city and even industrial workers people who hadn't ever lived through this kind of hunger started reaching out and the desperation uh, that we saw was really the starting point and i i i used to come back uh, you know with all the stories of of people speaking about the the humiliation of standing in lines for hours to get a small uh, ladle of food what have we redu- i've never seen this kind of hunger uh, in 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 cities i've seen it a few times as a district magistrate in in the countryside but never in cities and uh, and i think that was the first spur for the book uh, and and then of course the idea of the lockdown and whether this was necessary and you know i quickly understood that what people were suffering was not because of the virus it was not an act of god it was an act of extreme hubris of the people who 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 make decisions about our lives uh, and uh, these were public policy choices that we made that were made uh, which uh, which imposed uh, an enormous amount of human suffering that i don't think is going to go away the, co- the economy is contracting you in your lifetime and in mine we've not seen this kind of contraction of an economy and what it means uh, what it mean to the lives of the poor uh, how were these decisions taken and then of course the highly private privatized health system what was happening to people when when they did fall sick uh there were many questions and 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 you know uh, i felt i needed to tell the story uh because it was not being told and uh, my editor uh, ravi singh uh, has done many books with me uh, from the days he was in penguin now on speaking tiger but he told me that he felt that this book in some ways uh, was closest to his heart uh, because he felt that 50 years later when people want to know what happened at this time uh, he felt that they they would among other things go go back to this book and, and the importance of telling the story uh, while it is unfolding uh, to uh, to a, to a middle class society and to a state which has sh- shown spectacular lack of compassion uh was very important for me is yes, so uh, and, and this is really uh, uh, a tribute to the publisher for having uh, having good idea you want to write this right away because this is this is going to be the documentation that we will read 100 years later also this is possibly one of the greatest events of the millennium uh, but the first major point that you make the uh, in the book is the point about the lockdown itself the rationale for the lockdown uh, and you make a very persuasive argument saying why did we lock down did we have to uh, both in uh, both a priori and in hindsight you are very clear that this kind of a lockdown was not warranted could you tell us a little bit about that see even you know many people say uh, the lockdown was necessary but it was badly implemented it was done to hastily and so on and so forth uh, i i i i don't agree at all uh, and i'll explain very quickly why uh, the prime minister actually gave the rationale for the lockdown in his speech when he gave us 3 and 1/2 hours notice where he said it's necessary for us to stay indoors in our homes uh, work from home keep social distance uh, wash our hands regularly and so on and while he was speaking uh, i i was just stunned by the fact that the prime minister seemed to have forgotten that there are large numbers of people in this country for instance who don't have homes where they can stay in 9 out of 10 workers are informal workers who would not 
get uh, a day's wage by by not working and how would they eat uh he seemed to have forgotten that if if there are 10 people living in a shanty as the large majority of populations in in our cities do uh uh in a one room shanty 100 people sharing sometimes a community toilet what kind of social distance is possible i i i i just want to say that actually social distancing is something that we we are great at we've been doing it for 2000 years in our caste system uh we really need social solidarity of of the highest order but physical distancing but physical distancing was impossible for the large mass and when he was telling us to uh, telling people to wash their hands i mean you just have to look at any slum and you'll find people scrambling over each other to buy pots of water for 10 rupees 20 rupees and 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 how are they going to wash their hands uh, regularly so even in its design and that's the point that i want to make even at its in its best implementation it excluded from its protections the large mass of of, of the laboring poor in india and the destitute poor if at all it was designed to protect people like you and me who had homes who had uh, secure jobs uh, who could keep uh, physical distance who could wash their hands regularly and i think that it was an act of immense political immorality uh, uh, and cruelty to exclude uh, from even the design of, of the lockdown the large mass of the poor uh of course there are many other things i mean the lockdown was justified in terms of uh, you know taking the time to build the medical infrastructure to deal with uh, the virus when it comes but we have over over not just this government but the past uh, through new liberal uh, in india reached a point where 80% of india's trained health personnel work for the for profit private sector and and they were not available to us at all uh, so and the prime minister talked about you know creating one lakh new beds he was he was being economical with the truth because what they were mainly doing was repurposing existing beds uh, so you had uh, you know bombay cancer patients were turned out and made to lie on mats under an overbridge in the name of creating facilities for 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 covid without nationalizing at least temporarily uh, the private health care system we would never have could not have the health personnel to create this health infrastructure so uh, uh, and the impact of i mean you, you you never in history have you overnight shut down all of demand and all of supply uh, for for an entire country even china which in a sense invented and pioneered this idea of the lockdown locked down at its peak 5% of its population we locked down 100% of our population when there were just 500 recorded cases in this country i mean if people needed to i mean it was when you were locking people into those shanties uh, you were actually creating uh, you know hot houses for for the for the massive multiplication of the virus uh, uh, rather than protecting uh, people Uh, because there's nothing the virus loves more than undernourished uh, closely packed bodies uh, uh, and and that's how it spread and, and and when people went out onto this you know st- finally realized that the state is not going to protect us employers are not going to protect us we had the largest movement distress movement of human populations uh, in history ex- even greater than the partition except the movement of slave uh, in the slave trade from africa to america that didn't move our our leaders so i think that 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 it's an act i i i've used the term and i know it's it's going to raise a lot of hackles i don't think it was a, just a mistake i think it was a a crime against humanity it was a genocidal set of public policies uh, for which the poor will have and will continue to pay a, an extreme cost of human suffering children dropping out of school uh you know uh, joblessness is uh, has has grown we seeing hunger on the scale that we've not seen in a city uh, before uh, because in in a city i work with the urban poor uh, however however poor you may, you might be uh, however uh, difficult your circumstances even a street child within a week learns how he can uh, you know uh, uh, recycle plastic bottles and 
and earn 150 to 200 rupees a day. That is why people come to the city. And uh, so, uh, and that is why people come into the city. And I think we need yeah. to. Uh, uh, and for the city to see hunger, hunger was is rare in a city. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not absolutely not there. Uh, our homeless people, for instance, there many days when they don't get work, but they at least have a gurdwara to go to. They have a darga or a, a temple to to eat in. Um, all of that shuts down. Uh, and very soon, I mean, just one, one other quick thing. Uh, very soon we realized that it was not just the homeless. I mean, where uh, homeless populations, uh, there's a place called Yamuna Pushta where 4,000 homeless single men completely with no one in the world live normally. That's what swelled by the third day to about 10,000 people. They were falling over each other. Just the rumor that somebody was distributing food and people would sort of scramble, falling. I mean, there was no question of any kind of distancing. But within three, four, five days, I think our phone numbers became like distress call numbers. De facto, people kept circulating them. And we started getting calls from industrial workers, factory areas, mm -hmm. uh, where small marginal, uh, small tiny units, all of them had shut down. And these were workers who, who told us that never in their lives had they ever put out their hands uh, to anyone for food. And here they were standing in lines for, for one kilometer, two kilometer long lines for three hours uh, for a plop of food. Uh, their landlords were, were harassing them, not just for the, for, uh, not just for uh, the rent, but they were saying that, you know, Mr. Modi is saying that, uh, you know, if you go out uh, of your homes, you're going to bring back the virus. You're going out of your homes, you know, all day to get the food and they're saying we have no other option we have no food and some one person really remarked uh, and I think it was very among the many telling remarks that I heard he said that Modi says that uh, if if we crowd together in places uh, we will get the virus and die he, it seems he wants us to die because that's the only way we can get food every day is by crowding together uh, and, and so I, you know, so so I think it is. It, it, it was uh, an an act of extreme hubris by those who lead us, but also a profound lack of compassion. You know, it's very interesting, and, and this contrast is again raise a lot of hackles. But India is hyphenated either with China or with Pakistan, and uh, and Pakistan is really interesting because Pakistan is a very poorly governed state. Uh, and I'm no fan of it, uh, Imran Khan. But uh, Imran Khan, this playboy, elite guy, etc., when he was asked to follow India's uh, example and shut down all of Pakistan, he, his reply was, if we were an, uh, a rich industrialized country where everyone had homes and social security, I could have considered it. But what will happen, and the word he used was my poor people, what will happen to my poor people I know that without a day's uh, work, they will not be able to eat. And so he refused to have a lockdown. And he, they, they did very little else. But yes. their control of COVID is actually much better than ours. Their economy slowdown is much less than ours. It's not going into a negative. And it's only because of some elementary display of public compassion, which we, which we don't have in this country. And the middle class has applauded it throughout when asked to come onto balconies and bang thalis and light candles. We didn't ask, what about people who don't have balconies to go out into, you know? Uh, what about them? Uh, we were content because we felt we were being protected uh, by this government, and we didn't care about what happened to the large mass of the labouring poor. Absolutely. One of the, one of the uh, you know, refreshing and one of those lovely parts of the book that I really enjoyed, uh, which was which was very heartwarming, was you also talk about that middle class that came out. And, you know, you, you were very impressed by that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? In all this grimness, that was such a, that was such a lovely part of the book that made us feel nice. Actually, I can continue to hope because of, 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 of those acts of kindness. I call them circles of kindness. And and I encountered them from you know from the 
from the second day when I was on the streets. I was not alone on the streets. Uh, you know, firstly, starting with my own young colleagues. I mean, it, nobody was giving anyone instructions, mm -hmm. but a significant number of them said, "We have to be with you on the streets, and let us make sure that we reach as much food as we can to as many people." In the end, across the country, actually, we had never imagined we would do this. We distributed more than 10 million meals uh, across the country. The people sent us money from all over the world. But, but it was made possible through the courage and compassion of young people who, at a time when there was extreme fear, I mean, it was unscientific, the levels of fear that, you know, I've seen it with leprosy and so on. It was that kind of fear. And I, you know, remember this, a young colleague asked him, uh, aren't you frightened of Corona? And he said something which remains embedded in my heart. He said, uh, I am frightened of getting uh, the Corona virus, but much greater than my fear is their hunger. Wow. So I have to be on the streets. Uh, we run shelters for homeless people with TB who are particularly vulnerable. And I said, what is going to happen to them? Four young men volunteered to, they, they told their families, we're not going to come back now for the next, we don't know how long. We will stay and live with, with, with these patients and take care of them. Uh, you know, that kind of compassion. But ordinary middle class people as well, you know, when, when the migrants were walking, I would stand, be standing there in the hot sun and I would see car after car after com, car coming, you know, with water pouches, with food. Uh, you know, and people would just get out of the car, give it to some migrants, they would accept it respectfully and move on. And these people would quietly leave. The police, there were no rules that this was allowed, but the police was, you know, they'd see food and relief materials in your car and they'd say, just, just go, uh, we won't stop you. Uh, uh, and most of all, even more than all of this, the kindness of the poor to the poor and the very poor to the very poor. Is, is something that I observe. Uh, I'm reminded a lot about one of my favorite uh, works of literature, which is uh, The Grapes of Wrath by John mm -hmm, Steinbeck. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, about the Great Depression and very similar conditions. And one of the recurring themes, and the book ends as well, is how people who had absolutely nothing shared and kept uh, held in solidarity people who had nothing. Uh, and I, I remember the last sequence of the book is uh, is a woman whose baby uh, at her breast dies of hunger, and uh, and she sees an old man who's almost dying, and she actually gives her breast uh, of milk to this old man so that he survives. And I think it sort of symbolized uh, a lot of what I saw. I saw this. I mean, I, very early on, I outside Nizamuddin, I was seeing this homeless man. I was I kept keep talking to people, so I said. How did you survive? See, he said, I had a little money uh, saved up and I, I, I'm, I'm buying food. But he said, I'm alone, but I didn't buy food. For, I couldn't buy food just for myself. There's this homeless family with two small children next to me. I don't, they're not related to me, but I couldn't see those children hungry. So I would buy food for all of them together. That degree of kindness uh, is, I think, why we'll perhaps still survive as a nation uh, through uh, this this moment of extreme public cruelty uh, and uh, and uh, the breakdown of our solidarities. Uh, to all the all the viewers, everybody who's watching us here, and and uh, members of the Hyderabad Hyderabad Literary Festival family, there are many reasons to read this book. And uh, you know, one of the one of the primary reasons is this hope that it offers. It's really so touching to read these stories of uh, of young and old, of the poor and the middle class, who, in despite everything that that has fallen apart, have come and upheld this idea of compassion that Harshmandar talks about almost all the time. Uh, the book is, you know, the book is. Uh, I'm really a a very big fan of the book uh, because it ticks off all the boxes that I would like to see in any uh, in any uh, treaties. It is full of very very uh, well researched data, very good uh, understanding of that data and an insight that that it draws from that. Uh, it has very sharp political insight, sharp uh, unapologetic uh, political insight, 
and how and and where and 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 then identification of where the problem lies but it also um brings up some very uh, very nice stories so the style that with the book with which the book is written it appeals to those who want to read the story of what happened it, it appeals to those who want a good uh, good uh, academic argument for what happened and why it shouldn't have and so on and it also proposes what needs to be done so in that sense it is such a complete uh, it's a, such a complete manuscript that uh, it is a must for everyone who wants to read a slice of india's history with a with an embellishment of what the idea of an indian ought to be so in that sense it's just a most remarkable piece of work so i will i will therefore take you to the one chapter that gets that that was that let, was let, really let me just interrupt amir for a, for a moment so uh, we we both spoke of our bond and our love for each other so you can uh, <laughs> really discount uh, <laughs> amir's <laughs> for the book uh, on that ground um, but one story actually which uh, which came to my mind while you were speaking uh, was about a muslim laborer Uh, who who had a disabled child and he had, was desperate to reach him to his village uh 200 kilometers away and he yeah. steals a bicycle from a hindu man and he leaves a letter behind saying uh, main aapka you know gunegar hu i have caused you harm but this is why i did it and uh, and i'm sorry and and and, and the story is that the man who owns the bicycle sweeping his veranda finds the letter and then decides that he's not going to complain to the police uh, about the the stealing of his bicycle it somehow symbolizes to me what can still hold us together mm-hmm. brilliant so you you mentioned the grapes of wrath when i read this it was uh, bishop scandalsticks and victor hugo mm-hmm. i mean it, 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 exactly uh, bringing up the same human emotion the same kindness and compassion with that priest which was evident here in very ordinary circumstances it's just awesome that's just a most touching story so i mean you know the right cue to talk about one chapter that is very disturbing and uh, and, and you know we've kind of forgotten it because it's about 10 months old but at one time the virus was a muslim virus and it was you know suddenly this biomedical phenomenon as you called it uh, becomes a religious issue Uh, how did that happen and 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 have we forgotten it is it is it over should we just you know forget it or did it leave behind some bad uh, some bad taste much more than bad taste uh, you know we have 200 million muslim indians and uh, it we are perhaps the second or third largest population of muslims around the world they equal citizens in every way and a uh, majority of them as the sachar committee reminded us are in uh, you know economic and social conditions as bad as the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes so they were suffering i mean you mustn't forget that the muslims were suffering in the way that other impoverished indians were suffering with the same fear with the same joblessness with the same uh, disruptions uh, uh, with the lockdown and within a week of of the lockdown uh we have a government with the media which successfully persuades the large mass of non muslim indians even reasonable people in normal times that muslims were deliberately spreading uh, the virus and were actually spitting into vegetables uh, which they were being sold so that other people would get the virus this was a new form of jihad the fact that the large majority of indians uh but persuaded within a week of this uh troubles me hugely because i i mean i still believe uh, i was you know whenever i talk to muslim people and you know in, in despair i say uh you know you think you are the minority community we are the majority community but that's not true because the conflict is not between hindus and muslims the conflict is between those who uh, misuse religion for for hate and those who believe in respecting every religion and you and i belong to the former uh, to the latter community and we are the majority community of this country but moments like this really worry me because uh, we may not be communal but we are uh, eminently communal communalizable uh, you know and 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 the whole 
you know, network of the RSS across the country, and uh, most of the media completely compliant with uh, the spreading of hate, if that is the agenda of the government. Uh, I mean, it's it bears repetition that Parliament was going on. Firstly, the Tablighi Jamaat gathering was here done with permission. Everyone had visas; they had due permissions. The uh, Parliament was in session during exactly the same time. Uh, MLAs were being bought and sold in Madhya Pradesh, and a government toppled in, at exactly the same time. Sikh pilgrims were gathered in, in Nandir in Maharashtra at the same time. Hindu pilgrims were uh, were gathering in Tirupati at exactly the same time, and so on and so forth. But you uh, you deliberately choose one of these gatherings and make it out as if it was it was an act of such evil intent. Uh, uh, and uh, you persuade, and for days, uh, that is the propaganda. I mean, I, I've seen very reasonable Hindus actually saying this to Muslims, that, that you know, how could you come to this? Why, why are you spreading this virus to us? You know, uh, what have we done to you, etc., etc. And uh, And what would be going on in the hearts of our Muslim brothers and sisters when they hear this? It's not something that, has, that can pass. I mean, it will stay with us for a long time. Uh, I had tears in my eyes uh, a couple of weeks ago when I found that uh, foreign Tablighi Jamaat uh, uh, people who'd come from other countries had been kept in jail for all of this period. But the words that they said were so amazingly beautiful. They said, we still love India. And somebody remembers a, a, a jail warden who was worried about them during uh, the Rosas and used to smuggle in dates so that they would have something to break their fasts with. And for that act of kindness, he forgives India for everything else that, 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 it, that we did to them. But that we allowed people to stay in jail for 10 months, 11 months. Uh, e economists, statisticians tell you, of course, the numbers were large. If you choose any, you know, what is your... Uh, uh, denominator and, uh, and 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 so on and how do you so if they had concentrated similarly say on uh, you know other sets of 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 uh, pilgrims uh, of other religious identities you'd have found and you traced uh, all of them we'd have found high levels of infection in all of them but you did it in a way that was and not just that this was also the just uh, the riots had happened exactly a month earlier in Northeast Delhi. Uh, all the relief work, which was very, very limited, which uh, we were trying to do, which the government hadn't done, was all disrupted. Uh, the protests were still going on. The first, on the first day of the lockdown, what happens? You find that they go into Jamia Milia University, which had these walls full of the most beautiful uh, protest graffiti, poetry, paintings by young people. And those were whitewashed, as if that was really the most important thing to do uh, immediately after uh, you know, we, we were hit by the greatest um, pandemic of, of the century. Uh, the, through the period of the extreme lockdown, they started arresting people uh, from the community, and even lawyers were not allowed and uh, to go out in their defense. So it's been a time where uh, uh, where the government got the opportunity to advance its principal project of uh, dividing this country on the basis of religion and fostering hate as, you know, I, I, it's not just normalizing of hate, it's the valorizing of hate and bigotry. Uh, that uh, that uh, the imagination of this government of the kind of India it wants it, it it used this, and authoritarian leaders across the world have have done it. It used it to crush dissent, to uh, to demonize minorities, to create scapegoats, uh, and, uh, and and I don't think I mean among the many uh, wounds we will carry for for what happened over the last six eight uh, eight months ten months, these are wounds that will be very hard to heal. <laughs> True, sir. True. I mean, this was a very strange episode and, uh, uh, you know, likes of which we haven't seen uh, anywhere. Uh, and, and, you know, 
that chapter was so that and the power so, of of their communication is is again mm. you know it struck me also during demonetization i mean all, all of us were standing in lines but how did it happen that across the country if anyone complained you would be reminded of soldiers standing at siachen and yeah. saying they can do this for the country can't you stand in line for this country how they are able to reach these messages uh you know and the, the and and is a similar kind of network which reached it along with of course uh, a compliant media and we had you know markaz etc was you know, broadcast even uh, government like the government of delhi uh, was also talking about Uh, the markers as the central source of of, of the uh, of the virus so i think that that uh, it, 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 america has just emerged from uh, from the darkness of donald trump's regime uh, i i sometimes think you know if if in america the ku klux klan was a legal organization uh, it was overground and it gathered every morning uh, in every art and neighborhood and had drills and they openly supported the agenda of of donald trump of or his white supremacist uh, agenda how much more dangerous he would have been and how mm. much harder it would have been to dislodge him i don't think we recognize in india the, the battle is not I mean, the problem is not Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah. For me, the problem is 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 society and us, and and how we have allowed an ideology of hatred and division, which is completely in contradiction to everything that the freedom struggle and uh, the constitution stands for, to become so legitimate and mainstream, and more and more of our our friends. uh you know uh, for my colleagues my extended family we are a partition family we we came my parents came from down to me my extended family suffered a great deal so how the bigotry that i never heard in my childhood it must have been there but people hid it uh has now become uh, an act of uh, national uh, patriotism uh that you can only love your religion by hating another religion where is gandhi ji told us you can only actually love your religion by respecting and loving every other religion you can only love your country by hating other countries a 19 year old girl uh, stands up and says hindustan zindabad pakistan zindabad she was trying to communicate she said why should i have anything against the people of pakistan she's 19 years old she's trying to explain something to us they put her into jail on sedition charges for 40 50 days Uh, uh it is those voices which say which say that i love my country but i wish well people of every other country i was in anti ca protest people would even say modi murdabad and i would try to stop them i would say that no we i wish him well let him have live long and have a healthy life and let us just uh you know just fight on on the basis of principles in shahin bagh this old lady said to me said 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 uh, she said i hope allah will put rahim or, or mercy into the heart of mr modi i found it a very sweet articulation because she still believed that mr modi was was reclaimable and uh, and uh, and she wished him well and uh, so when uh, when a slogan was uh, you know one of the ministers had the slogan uh, desh ke gaddaron ko goli maro saalon ko uh shahin bag developed its own slogan and i think we should all remember this their slogan was uh desh ke sab pyaron ko uh phool barsao saaron ko i mean that uh, you know all these beautiful people across the country including the ones who are talking about goli maro etc maybe only shower them with flowers that is i think our battle so uh, as we come towards the end um to the main uh, concern that you have uh, and you have explained and articulated it uh, the whole uh, issue of how we treated the poor and and the fact that over the last year we've seen possibly the worst contraction ever uh, we are talking about at least a 12% contraction in the economy it's not a recession it's not just a growth rate going down 
and so therefore that is going to have some serious impact on our sdgs on our poverty numbers on all our social indicators and that is something that you have highlighted so very loudly uh, it's strange that despite that yesterday a big uh, you know television channel uh, has uh, this uh, this really uh, i guess not so surprising anymore survey that shows that the government did a fabulous job of handling covid so it just it just beats uh, reason but but i would really like you to tell us in this last couple of minutes what do you think uh, i mean what, what's your solution you have a chapter there you know one of the one of the brilliant parts of the book is that it ends with what we need to do and how we need to go forward so could you just take us through that what do you want the government to do what do you want us to do the social activists the ngo all all Uh, you know, sensible people who are listening to this program. What do you want? You know, I I'm more and more convinced uh, that the solutions are only in solidarity, in in public displays of standing together. That when you know when we heard the prime minister telling us to do all of those things when the lockdown was announced, at that very moment we should have said, but what about the poor? Uh, what will happen to them? Uh, I I write somewhere in my book uh, that when those fi- fancy buses were organized for the students who were stranded in Kota could we have had one student just one boy or girl who would say I refuse to get on to this bus and go home unless you provide these same uh, facilities to the migrants uh, who are who are walking home in these conditions the migrants were in these container bus containers they had paid sometimes 4000 5000 rupees perhaps more than a, a flight ticket to be in this airless place uh, you know all of this was happening and we didn't seem to care uh, what did we do with our own domestic helpers what did we do and it's going to uh, so uh, uh, prabhat patnaik and jyoti ghosh to very fine economists and i co wrote uh, a, a series of opinion pieces where we said simply if the middle class is getting their salaries by sitting at home provide the equivalent of minimum wages to all persons and pds universally and just these two measures would cost us no more than 3% of the gdp and if they had done this actually if they had done this the disruption in the economy would not have happened people would not have had to run run away uh, our trains had the capacity of carrying 23 million people a day uh, the total number of you know the estimates of the total number of migrants who went home was about 30 million we only had to run our train services for the migrants when there were just 500 cases and allowed people to go if you and i are in a time of catastrophe we would like to be with those who love us those who care for us uh, let people go when there were just 500 cases give a you know a minimum survival uh, package with dignity to everybody not making them like line up to uh, you know to beg for food um, uh, empty out your jails nationalize the healthcare system uh, these were elementary things and these are things that are, and and test 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 you know basically uh, have testing to anyone who seeks testing uh, south korea had testing at metro stations at bus stations whoever went the moment somebody was they didn't have a lockdown at all and they would trace immediately when when somebody was in they had nice dignified places for 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 quarantine uh, vietnam much poorer than us has succeeded in 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 controlling the virus through not draconian lockdowns but through this process of training and community support uh the the the, the immense tragedy is that this degree of suffering has been imposed with hubris with no regret when countries around the world have actually demonstrated and it's very interesting that some of the best countries which have shown the greatest compassion have all been led by women and it cannot be a coincidence so new zealand taiwan uh, germany uh, denmark finland are all led by women and they have you know they had leaders who kept speaking to the people kept explaining to them caring about uh, you know how they would be surviving uh, expressing solidarity through this difficult time uh, 
it's not so complicated but we have to build a society that is based on the idea of solidarity of fraternity which is written into our constitution bandhuta in hindi which is you know if somebody wants to understand i would say it simply means uh your pain is my pain so pehlu khan ke peet pe chabuk lage mere peet pe dard uthe uh that is that and in many friends get impatient saying you know that's not a solution it's taken a 100 years for 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 the rss and the hindu mahasabha to bring our country to this point and they worked with great dedication and commitment we who believe in a country which is based on equal respect and love how much have we done and, and unless we do it i mean every second indian is below the age of 25 they have to decide what country they want to grow up in and give to their children and there is no other way the fight has to actually begin on their in their living rooms with their parents very often with their siblings with their friends with with their co-workers on their family whatsapp groups this is a battle of hearts and minds and that will decide the india that we will give and a just and caring state can only exist in a just and caring society the problem is not uh, mr modi it's it's our adulation and uh, and, and and support for what he stands for uh, that is my problem Wonderful, sir. Ajay, uh, we are at the end. We are at the end. Over to you. Yeah. Allow, allow me to uh, yes. take on for the next ten minutes, ladies yes. and gentlemen. You will agree why Harsh Mandir is considered to be the conscious keeper of this of this country, uh, precisely because what he said in this last fifty minutes. Thank you so much, Harsh. This was absolutely wonderful. Amir, you did a wonderful job of uh, of doing this. uh there are a few questions that have come up harsh and i'll i'll pass them on to you mm-hmm. uh, uh a couple of foundational issues one uh i had thought uh, like many others that demonetization was the worst uh, crime that uh, the country that uh, the government could have done against the country mm-hmm. and that something like that after that experience would not be repeated but the inept handling of the covid crisis the um, uh, the entire manner in which the covid crisis and the migrant issues were uh, uh, handled uh, demonstrates that uh, things can go even worse than what we thought they would and the most disturbing part of this is that uh, uh, people still seem to support uh, all that has happened now what is the underlying uh, uh, principle that we need to understand out of it it's a great question ajay and i struggled with it a lot uh, there was an uh, a journalist for time magazine who covered uh, as a cover story uh, the migrant uh, exodus and he had a long interview with me as well so what was interesting was that he takes one migrant worker and tells his story and all the suffering that he goes through he happens to be a hindu uh, migrant worker and after all of that narrative is over he asks him who will you vote for in the next election and he says i will vote for modi ji and uh, the journalist then asked me in my interview how do you explain this and i said that what i understand is that what our present government has succeeded in doing is to inject our veins of society with a drug which is the most lethal of all drugs and that drug is uh, is called hatred and hum you know we are intoxicated with this drug and once you are intoxicated even hunger is acceptable even joblessness is acceptable even you know displacement from your family all this suffering is acceptable because at last we have a government which is which has shown the resolve to take on this constructed enemy within uh, 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 which is, which is the muslim and 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 and, and so the battle i mean people ask me did about the anti ca protest and its crushing or whether the farmers try, uh, struggle outside in the borders of delhi will succeed to my mind they have already succeeded because it is not the outcomes that determine your success it's the fact that hindus and muslims stood together it was the largest movement uh, for hindu muslim unity that this country has seen since before Gan- uh, since gandhi ji's assassination uh it is uh, uh the, the way farmers have stood together across communities i mean it has healed so many different so it is through 
through standing you know that i make up my mind that whoever is suffering injustice i will stand up i will raise my voice i will stand with them to my mind there's no other way that we can fight this battle and our governments will follow us unfortunately our political parties which call themselves secular and so so on have not shown the moral courage i mean think of mahatma gandhi in at the time of partition 1 million people had died in hindu muslim violence almost equally on both sides my own family was displaced from rawalpindi people were living under tents there was huge suffering there was so much anger a new country had been constituted on the basis of religion it was very easy for india to decide pakistan is for muslims india is for hindus but he he said no india is a country that belongs equally to every person who who regards it as their own country it that's why i call it, you know it's love but i call it radical love because it is love which requires in enorm- enormous courage and you're willing to give up your life for that love and 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 i think that there is no other way to fight this and there's no shortcut a generation will have to fight and reclaim the the india that uh, the freedom struggle uh, people who took part in the freedom struggle gave my generation and yours a country with a set of dreams and set of ideals we made such a mess of it now every second indian is below the age of 25 we are handing them this country let them decide and let them fight and i and they'll have to fight for a generation to to rebuild the idea of a country based on solidarity and equality love otherwise the end point would be a hindu rashtra <laughs> yeah it is it we, we already are i mean i yeah, already I, are i agree with when when i see what is happening in up uh, for instance i mean yeah just for example you you have the the chief minister actually calling a meeting of uh, generals of police igs sps to investigate what he calls love jihad uh, consensual uh, relationships between muslim men and hindu women and they, there's not a, a single murmur that this is against the constitution the constitution gives us the freedom to choose our religion and choose our partner and uh, and so on so it's as if the constitution now doesn't exist for up in many different ways and i think that's the india that we are we, we are fast hurtling to if the anti ca protests had not happened if the farmers protest had not happened uh, we would have been much further down that line uh, a couple of questions three four questions have come up on one issue uh, while you are analyzing and uh, critiquing the handling of the covid uh, issue and the migrant issue was there another way the government could have done it or is our wisdom by hindsight that's the crux of the question that that's a great question and our wisdom is not on hindsight because we were saying this from day 1 and uh, on record and i also written a very long chapter the path not taken in the book uh, at the end end but truly uh, we have examples of poorer countries which decided not to go for a lockdown for precisely the reason that i've explained but you go in for what is called test 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 you know we should have done massive testing uh, uh and uh, and once the testing is done we do we have very small limited lockdowns where we find uh, infections have spread we trace uh, their contacts uh, and so on but those are not stigmatized places of lockdown but mm, uh, places of solidarity dharavi in our own you know in india actually is a, is, is is one of the most beautiful examples the community they decided to fight it is one of the most densely populated places in the world on the planet and i thought that it would just you know be see masses of dead bodies they did precisely this testing testing tracing uh, and they converted stadium they had yoga the places where you were isolated were actually happy places people stood together uh, uh and to the extent you had to limit people's tra- movement uh, give them minimum wages give them relief equivalent to what they would have earned it is not their fault uh, you know countries have done uh, we have a very right wing government in 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 london i work with the homeless i was talking to people there what's happened to the homeless the government they, they actually had checked in homeless people during the lockdown into f- seven star hotels five star hotels all the hotels the rooms were full the hotels kept functioning the bills were paid by the government homeless people were also in places of protection 
it's possible you know if we if we can't even dream of that happening in india uh, because we don't have that imagination of a homeless person's life being as valuable as yours and mine so uh, london itself i mean england itself uh, wanted the hotel uh, the restaurant business to start so the government said we will pay 50% of uh, of of you go out into restaurants uh, sit in uh, on sidewalk so that you you're safe and 50% of the bill will be paid by uh, by the government i mean they we could have kept the economy going we could have you know uh, it, it, it's not and and when they were putting more and more people into jail we should have under trials with petty offenses should all have been out no political prisoners should have been in uh, we could have handled all of this and of course i keep underlining with 80% of health personnel in the for profit sector without nationalizing as spain did without nationalizing our private health care at least for the period of the national emergency there is no way we could have provided uh the healthcare facilities that we need i've been a collector spaces is not a problem i'm sitting in delhi the stadium the colleges were closed the universities were closed we could have built beautiful places but we needed trained personnel to to run these services so uh so so these are some of the things that i would have done this, this was absolutely wonderful thank you so much harsh for all that you do all that you have done and for today this was absolutely fantastic i would urge my audience to go and buy this book book point is selling it go and buy this book this is going to be a treasure for you to read and enjoy uh, amir thank you so very much for handling this so very well ಗಣ್ಣೆಲ್ಲಿಂದ ವಂಗಿ ಪುಲೆ ರಂಗ ಕೊಂಗಂದು ತೂನೆ ವಂಗಿ ಪುಲೆ ರಂಗ